It seems like everybody's got an empty 10 gallon enclosure in their basement and they don't know what to do about it. But are 10 gallon enclosures good enough for any reptile for their whole life? Well, yes. And these five you've never heard of. My name's Adam, this is Alora. You're watching Wiccans Wicked Reptiles, stick around. I don't mean to be a negative Nancy, but uh, there's not gonna be leopard geckos on the list. Leopard geckos need a 20 gallon enclosure or larger. So sorry about that. If you're here for leopard geckos, there's a video right here for you. And what's this big monstrosity in the background? None of your business for about three more weeks. But if you want, I'll make a full build video. It's like a hundred and, wait, sorry, 1200 gallons? Put in the comment section what you think's going in it. Okay, usually I'll start off by saying, don't go for bare minimum, which I agree. But all of these animals, I think, can live a comfortable life in a 10 gallon enclosure. So we're not stuffing things in here. Of course, bigger is almost always better. And that's true for all five of these animals. And you guys know that I like to ruin lists with amphibians. So let's start off with a frog. The rest are reptiles, I promise. And I do realize frogs are amphibians, not reptiles. Starry night reed frogs. Okay, so reed frogs are really cool in general, but starry night reed frogs are very cool because of the way that they look. These are small arboreal frogs, they are reed frogs, they're nocturnal, and they look like the night sky, hence their name. These are some of the most majestic, magnificent, jet black animals with the yellow speckling. Obviously, jet black animals are always super popular. Indigo snakes, jet black monitors we've got, the black dragons, uh, Mexican black king snakes, all of these are really popular animals, and I think it extends to frogs but most people don't know they exist because they're difficult to find. The good news is if you find them, they're most likely captive bred. This is important. Captive bred means they're bred in captivity rather than poached from the wild. They're not poached, I shouldn't say it like that because some of them are legally and sustainably collected. The problem is these guys are from Madagascar. There's very little protection for anything in Madagascar. I've been there, I've never seen tree devastation, forest devastation like it super sad but i did find some of these in madagascar it's the only place i've seen them i've never seen them in captivity here in canada but in the u.s you can go to places like josh's frogs and they're relatively inexpensive and they do well in groups so obviously you want a 10 gallon enclosure standing up this is a 10 gallon enclosure and so is this now obviously the dimensions of a standard aquarium that you can buy for 10 or 20 bucks at a garage sale or a flea market or whatever works. And there is uh, kits that you can use to actually make your horizontal enclosure a vertical one, or you can use a front opening glass one. But either way, these frogs need a taller than wider enclosure. They're insectivores, they're really cool. The call isn't too loud, but it's still relatively loud. I wish that I could find them. Cause can you imagine this giant, super cool enclosure for these start, like, I don't know, I just think it'd be cool to have them in there, like a bunch of them together with a mister and a fogger. And anyway, that's for another day. Number four, we will talk about some geckos and some terrestrial ones, but it's not gonna be leopard geckos. I'm talking about stenodactylus or dune geckos or elegant sand finger geckos or sand geckos, whatever you wanna call them. These are one of my favorite species that I recently got. I got two different species, stenodactylus stenodactylus and stenodactylus petri, petrii. I don't know, you're not here because I'm smart. You're here, I don't even know why you're here, honestly. Let's just talk about sand geckos for a bit and move on to the next one. These guys live on sand. So most people will say, oh, you can't keep reptiles on sand because of impaction. These guys, as long as you're keeping them on a natural grain of sand, so a play sand, which is round grain, not angular, you're okay. Basically, angular grain sand is built, well, it's made for builders because it sticks together, which will happen inside your gecko. And play sand is round grain, which is natural, how sand naturally occurs. And it's circular or oval or uh, spherical is the word I'm looking for here. So it doesn't stick and clump together so it can pass through your gecko. Now these guys do live in parts of the Middle East where it's literally just sand. Like what you think of in your head when you see a desert, that's the type of area that these guys live. Not all deserts are like that, but that's where these guys live. They're insectivores and they're really tiny. So you're gonna feed them really tiny insects for the most part. They like it hot, they like it dry, they're really easy to take care of in my opinion, and they do great in groups. Not just females, but males too. In general, male stenodactylus aren't gonna fight each other, which is pretty incredible because if you put two leopard geckos together that are males, and then you went to bed, in the morning, you'd be getting one of them off the side of the tank with a hose. It'd be some assembly required. It would not be good. The same is not true with stenodactylus or sand geckos. I think that they're cool. I think they're gonna be one of the next big things. I think that, I mean, 
I'm talking about him. Daffy's talking about him. Dion at Reptiliatus is talking about him. I think that these guys are going to blow up kind of in the same way that you saw the Dumoulin's Boas blow up in 2020. Same sort of idea here. I really think they're the next big thing. Oh, and they can live in 10 gallon enclosures because they're itsy bitsy. Number three, smooth green snakes. Take caution. I'm telling you, if you get a smooth green snake, don't get a wild caught one. Get one that was bred in captivity. They're few and far between, but I think you're going to see more of them, gruff green snakes too, but smooth green snakes are generally smaller and do better in an arboreal setup where, say, the stenodactylus need a horizontal setup because they're terrestrial. These snakes are, well, they're not terrestrial. They're arboreal, so you need a taller tank. They're really small and they're not heavy bodied, so they're not going to ruin your plants for the most part if they're settled in really well. Be careful with plants that you just planted. Of course, a snake even this small could rip them out. They're not the easiest thing in the world to breed, but there is captive breeding efforts. And their eggs are tiny. They look like Tic Tacs. They're about the size of a penny. By the way, Americans, why do you still have pennies? Just get rid of them. Australia did it. We did it. Just, what, what are they used for? Besides measuring the size of smooth green snake eggs, which are really, really small, by the way. Now, when I say small, we're talking 14, 15, 16 inches, maybe up to 20, but this is going to be rare. So they're small and they're slender and they're not going to hurt you if they do bite you, but generally they're pretty placid animals. As far as arboreal snakes go, arboreal snakes get a bad rap for being kind of nippy or bitey. These guys don't have to worry about that. They're generally pretty placid. And guess what? They're insectivores, which means they're going to eat things like slugs and crickets and stuff like that. So if you want a snake that you don't have to feed mice to, or even fish, or anything like that, well, I mean, obviously most snakes aren't going to work for you. But if you want a snake that eats insects only, this is the snake for you. Well, I guess blind snakes are smaller and they eat larvae, but we cover those in this video right here. So let's move on to number two. Back to geckos for a second, viper geckos. Viper geckos are the coolest. They have this amazing keeled scale that is reminiscent of a viper snake. I know obviously there's tons and tons of vipers, but when I think of a viper, I think of like a bush viper, a squam, eyelash viper, something with a keeled scale. You know what I mean? Something the quintessential viper. And these guys have a scale like that. Plus they have a cryptic ladder type pattern on their backs. Oh, and by the way, they're like three inches, okay? So these guys are tiny, teeny tiny, itsy bitsy. They're from Pakistan. So imagine what you think of, like the lowlands of Pakistan, by the way. So they're gonna need it warm, not that humid, but they're very hardy. In fact, they can deal with dips down into the 60s at night. At night, dad. <laughs> I'm not saying you should do this. I'm just saying they can. So there's not something that, you know, if you don't give it perfect care or, you know, the lights go out or your power goes out for a day, you're probably gonna be okay. They aren't super specialized, but they're super cute. They eat insects. So it's kind of like taking care of a smaller leopard gecko in a sense. Same sort of humidity, similar temperature. It's not the exact same, of course. And they've got those fat tails. Now they're not a fat tail gecko fat, but they're pretty darn fat. In fact, some people will call them turnip tailed or carrot tailed geckos. They can fit in a 10 gallon enclosure, horizontal, not vertical. And you're going to give them a, if you want to give them a loose substrate, the same sort of idea that you would do with a leopard gecko, which of course you can find in the care guide and the setup guide, but that's not this video. So let's move on to number one. Number one holds a special place in my heart because it's the only native lizard to Ontario where I live in Canada, five line skinks. And they don't only live in Ontario. They live all over the freaking place. But do not take them from the wild. Don't buy them for people who take them from the wild. Only captive bred because they are endangered. Several species. There's more than one species. So I'm telling you, don't do that. Don't be part of the problem. However, having them in captivity where they're captive bred is not a problem at all. It's the only skink on this list too because it's one of the smaller skinks in the world. Bright blue tail, especially on some of the other species that are actually native here to Ontario. They're super duper small. We're talking they max out at seven or eight inches, something like that. So keeping them in a 10 gallon that's horizontal rather than vertical because they're not going to climb all that much. They'll use some climbing space, but they're definitely not arboreal. It's kind of the best setup for them. They're going to eat things like insects. They're really not that difficult. Of course, this is not a care guide. So, you know, do your due diligence and figure out how to take care of them. Not some bald guy in his basement saying you should buy one. So you should. That's not what this is. And I know that some people are going to give me flack. Well, why are you talking about endangered animals? Isn't that bad? Well, no, no, it's not. Because 
crested geckos used to be endangered and now they're not, right? So just because something's endangered doesn't mean that we shouldn't have it in captivity. In fact, the only way that a lot of these endangered animals are able to proliferate their old range is from captive breeding efforts. And yes, that includes weirdos in their basement, not just research facilities. So with that said, of course, don't take them from the wild. I would never suggest that. Always buy captive bred, but they are endangered. And it is a pretty cool lizard that I bet you your friends don't have and you may have never heard about either. But I wanna hear from you. What do you think the best lizard, snake, whatever, reptile is best for a 10 gallon enclosure? Put it in the comment section below. As always, thanks if you hit like and subscribe. It really helps this channel. It costs you no money but a click and it really makes Alora and I smile. And a special thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys are freaking awesome. You get videos early, discounts on merch. We do one-on-one -on -one conversations a lot. All of that for as little as $1. That's it. I do videos Mondays and Thursdays. Please hit the like button and then I'll see you next week.